Hello, welcome to the Unresolved Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Whelan, and this episode is part two of the Misty Copsy story. If you haven't listened to part one, I highly recommend you go back and listen to that beforehand. In summary, in fall of 1992, 14-year-old Misty Copsy went missing after splitting up with her friend, Trina Bavard, at the Puyallup Fair. She hadn't been seen or heard of for months, but police decided to slap the runaway label on her case. They hadn't actively been investigating her whereabouts since. A local man named Corey Bober, who claimed to have predicted Misty's disappearance and warned the local police beforehand, took it upon himself to find out what had happened to Misty. Claiming that a former friend was the person responsible, and that this former friend was also the Green River Killer, Bober led a private investigation, which ultimately led him to the only piece of evidence recovered thus far, some articles of clothing that Misty was wearing on the night of her disappearance. These articles of clothing were found just a few hundred feet from where the bodies of two teenage girls were found in the years prior. Bodies that police believed belonged to a serial killer. From here, the label of the teenage runaway would begin to slip further and further away from the case, and police now had to take Cory Bober seriously. Detective Jim Doyon was sent out to the Highway 410 scene and put in charge of the investigation. This was King County territory, so he was now within his own jurisdiction. Doyon was surprised to meet Bober, who was not at all what he had been expecting. He was in his late 20s, was rather short and scrawny with a huge head of hair, and he was surprisingly giddy at the notion of uncovering the pants of a dead girl. The grizzled detective was wary of this unaffiliated investigator, but nonetheless let it slide. Bober, for all of his faults, had finally gotten some results. That counted for something, at least. Something that Jim Doyon noted was that the pants weren't located near the killer's usual dumping ground. The prior two victims' bodies had been found a ten-minute hike into the woods, and they had been found less than a few hundred feet apart from one another. These clothing items of Misty's, however, were located right off of the road, in a forested ditch area. This raised an eyebrow of the older detective, who had been out there just a week beforehand looking for any sign of Misty for over six hours. He did recognize that he might have missed or overlooked them, as forensic analysis proved that the pants had been covered in dirt for some time. So it wasn't likely that whoever dumped the pants had done so in days or weeks beforehand. They had probably been there for some time, maybe even months. While the case was beginning to heat up for Jim Doyon, Corey Bober began to marvel at his success. He had finally, for the first time in his decade-long investigation, been proven right. Meanwhile, Diana Smith, Misty's mother, returned home to an empty house, infuriated. She was infuriated at the police for refusing to look for her daughter, infuriated at herself for failing to protect her own child, infuriated at Cory Bober for unveiling this tragic truth. She was just infuriated and pissed off at the world. While Sergeant Herm Carver heard the news of the found clothing and immediately began to suspect Corey Bober and Diana Smith of foul play, Detective Jim Doyon continued his investigation into the area. He began setting up police dogs to sniff out the area, and even arranged for a helicopter with thermal imaging to fly over the area, pursuing anything. But one tip came up to Sergeant Carver, a tip from Dee Dee Miles, a friend of Misty's. She informed Carver that one of the people that constantly hung out at Misty's house was none other than Reuben Schmidt, who always left before Diana Smith would get home from her job. Despite this tip, Herm Carver refused to believe that Bober and Diana had stumbled upon the clothing accidentally. Despite the finding of the clothing, they still operated under the assumption that Misty Copsey was alive and, most likely, a runaway. Corey Bober was elevated high after Misty's clothing was found and he began to believe that he was the sole person keeping the case alive. In the following weeks, he began to work more closely with Pierce County Detective Tim Coble, leading him on a wild goose chase for another clue. First, Bober thought that Misty would be found under a bridge, then by a stop sign. He began to point out seemingly innocuous things, such as a pair of shoes hanging on an electric cable, as signs of the Green River Killer. He also began to profess his beliefs about Randy Atchziger to Detective Coble but Atchziger had long since been cleared as a suspect. Detective Coble managed to deal with Bober's frenetic energy for a while, as the two investigated all of Bober's wild thoughts and ideas. Meanwhile, Diana Smith was sinking quite low, and began to suspect Bober himself, of all people. 
After all, he had led the investigation right to articles of clothing and seemed to be overly interested in the case. However, this could be explained for other reasons. Corey Bober's sentencing for his drug charges was approaching later in February, and he pled guilty to charges in the hopes that helping out investigators would give him a lenient sentence. With a little bit of luck, he'd even be able to escape jail time altogether. So now, after his success in the woods finding Misty's clothing, he seemed poised to get off lightly by helping out investigators with an open case. However, his expectations were blown apart at the sentencing. Despite pleading guilty and trying to position himself well, an array of local cops testified at his hearing, painting Cory Bober in such a negative light that he was sentenced to 14 months of jail time. All of his work was now undone. Any good he might have done for the case was going to be postponed for over a year at which point the case wouldn't be just cold, it would be frozen. While Corey Bober was in jail, he was visited by Detective Tim Koble. Koble pleaded with him to give up any information he had on the case, especially the case file that he had spent years accruing against Randy Atziger, but Bober refused. He told Koble, along with Sergeant Carver and the other police officers that came to gloat, to literally go fuck themselves. He threatened to burn every bridge he had spent years building because he wanted personal credit for his effort and didn't want to just hand over everything to the police that he believed put him in prison. With Corey Bober now behind bars, Detective Jim Doyon remained the only person actively pursuing new leads. Jim Doyon was the first one to interview Misty's friend, Trina Bavard, and it had been nearly six months since the two had gone to the Puyallup Fair together. During this interview, Doyon showed Trina a picture of Misty's jeans, which had been found in the forested ditch. Trina began to cry, but was able to answer many of Detective Doyon's questions, cracking the surface that had remained untouched since Misty disappeared. Trina revealed that the original plan for the girls had been to get a ride from Reuben Schmidt, but on the night in question, he had balked and told them he didn't have enough money or gas to come and get them. Despite the two girls' insistence, and Misty telling Reuben how to get inside of her house to get some more money, he still refused to pick them up. However, Trina revealed that she did not trust Reuben, and was already planning on walking home or getting a ride from somebody else. The rest of Trina's story reflected what Diana had told investigators, that the two had split up sometime after 8.30, and that she had walked home to her house in Sumner shortly thereafter. Nothing suspicious had happened at the fair, no sketchy guys hitting on them or catcalling or anything. Whatever happened to Misty was as much of a mystery to Trina as it was to anyone else. After America's Most Wanted aired a segment on Misty Copsy, more tips began to roll in. All of them were called into Puyallup detectives, and given to Sergeant Herm Carver, who still maintained control over the case. Carver used those tips to try and lead Diana Smith away from Corey Bober, who was currently gaining a poor reputation as a snitch in prison. Despite this insistence, and battling her own suspicions of Cory Bober, she refused to do so. She instead told Sergeant Carver to redouble his efforts, and maybe look into Reuben Schmidt, who had long since been her only suspect. Carver, reluctantly, did that. And what he found was pretty alarming. Sergeant Herm Carver took a visit to Adam's Ribs, a restaurant where Reuben Schmidt occasionally worked at. The owner of the restaurant, Frank Rodriguez, revealed that Reuben had said some suspicious things about Misty following her disappearance, things such as knowing where she was buried. Apparently, Reuben had also told Frank and another co-worker slash friend that the cops investigating Misty's disappearance were, quote-unquote, off by about six and a half miles, which is a suspicious statement no matter the context. Sergeant Carver and his partner waited until Reuben would be returning to work, at which point the scrawny teenager took off running. Things were already off to a good start. A few hours later, after refusing to speak to police officers, Reuben was finally brought in by Carver and his partner to come in for an interview. When questioned by Carver on the past statements Reuben had made regarding Misty's burial site, Reuben referred to them as something he had said to, quote-unquote, 
Get Frank off of my back. Also, during the interview, Reuben restated what he had previously told Diana, that he didn't have enough gas to pick up the two girls, and that they had called multiple times, but he had kept telling them he didn't have gas. Despite this, one interesting note can be found from Sergeant Carver's notes during this time period. Reuben Schmidt would claim that he occasionally suffered from blackouts, periods of time where he loses all recollection of his memory, as if he had been asleep. Apparently, he had claimed to have a blackout immediately following Misty's second phone call to him, which lasted until the very next morning. That's right, even Reuben Schmidt has no idea where he was or what he did on the night of September 17, 1992. He claims that he woke up the next morning with no idea where he had been or with whom, and he would just decide to drive out to his grandmother's 100-acre farm in Buckley. He doesn't know why he drove out there or how. He was broke and had no gas, and there was nobody at the farm when he drove out there. It is interesting to note that Buckley is located very close to Enumclaw, and less than 8 miles away from where Misty's jeans had been found alongside Highway 410. Unfortunately, Sergeant Herm Carver didn't really buy into the fact that Reuben Schmidt was the suspect he had been looking for. When him and his colleagues issued a polygraph test for Reuben, it was done so as a technicality. At least, I sure hope so, because if they had taken the polygraph test seriously, I might not be making this episode of the podcast. During the polygraph, Detectives took note that Reuben Schmidt was trying to lure himself into a false sense of unconsciousness. He seemed to be trying to put himself to sleep, at least according to the notes from those observing him. Reuben's polygraph came back inconclusive, but that could have been based mainly on his unusual behavior. More than one detective made note of Reuben's odd activities during the test, as he seemed to be falling asleep throughout it. If you're unaware, polygraph tests are not very effective at measuring truth but a way to try and beat the test is to calm your nerves and lower your heart rate and blood pressure. Falling asleep is a sure way of doing both, and anyone trying to defeat the test in such a way warrants some suspicion in my mind. Add to that Reuben's suspicious behavior on the night in question, his supposed blackouts, his attraction to Misty, his absence of an alibi, running from the cops. Almost everything really paints him in a bad light. Yet the detectives involved, under the direction of Sergeant Carver, let Reuben go. He would remain a person of interest, but the detectives would do no further digging into him. They wouldn't talk to his friends, anyone that could vouch for his possible alibis, nothing. A day or two after this polygraph test, word would reach Diana Smith that Reuben had passed with flying colors, quote-unquote. That meant that her personal suspicions had been ruled out, and that night, she would start harassing Corey Bober's longtime suspect, Randy Atchsicker. A month or two later, however, Diana can't remember exactly when, Frank Rodriguez, the owner of Adam's Ribs, would give her a call. Rodriguez, if you remember, had been Reuben's employer for a while, and overheard Reuben make some very suspicious comments following Misty's disappearance. Rodriguez told Diana that the things Reuben had said were not normal things for anyone to say, and that he had told police about these statements. For Diana, this was the straw that broke the camel's back, and she stopped believing in the local police force entirely. The surprising reason that police dropped Reuben Schmidt from their investigation is because they had a brand new suspect to obsess over. Unfortunately, while police began to track down their new shiny lead, Reuben Schmidt would sell his 1974 Chevy Nova to a wrecking yard, for reasons that aren't quite clear. For months now, the story had been that on September 17, 1992, Trina Bavard and Misty Copsey said goodbye near the fairgrounds. And while Misty was waiting for her bus, Trina was walking home to nearby Sumner. Turns out, however, that this was a fabrication on Trina's part. Trina had actually gotten a ride from her older boyfriend, 23-year-old Michael Reiner, a young man eight years her elder. This stone was turned over when one of Misty's friends was contacted by Sergeant Carver who seemingly had no intention on following up on Reuben Schmidt. A background check on Michael Reiner revealed a sketchy past. He was 23 years old, with a juvenile rape that had not been charged from seven years beforehand. And he also had personal ties to both Kim Delange and Anna Chibetnoy, the two prior Puyallup victims. 
while the Puyallup police still publicly referred to Misty Copsey as a runaway, they were now beginning to dig a little deeper, due not only to the media scrutiny beginning to build up around them, but also due to King County's increasing involvement, courtesy of Detective Jim Doyon. When detectives spoke to 15-year-old Trina Bavard again, she revealed that she hadn't revealed the information about her older boyfriend because she didn't want to get in trouble, which is an understandable concern for a teenager. She claims that on the night of Misty's disappearance, she had tried to get in contact with Reiner, but Misty hesitated on getting a ride with him. Apparently, Misty didn't trust Michael for one reason or another. Detectives wondered whether or not Michael Reiner had dropped off Trina at home and then gone back for Misty, since there was an incident where Reiner may have hit on Misty in the past. Trina voiced her doubts about that, but ultimately had to reveal that she didn't know. Reiner had dropped her off at home and then left, so she couldn't vouch for him beyond that. In April, police would discover that Reiner was selling his car, a blue 1981 Ford Escort, that wasn't in great condition. Little did he know that he was selling the car to an undercover police officer, who took the car in and began testing the forensics found inside the car for samples of Misty. While the DNA test waited to be completed, amid a huge forensic backlog, Corey Bober toiled in his state prison cell. He was now sharing a cell with a convicted murderer, Joseph Duncan, a man that had tortured and killed an entire family. Bober, who had been nicknamed the Green River Killer for his obsession with the case by everyone inside the prison, was in jail for a minor drug offense and was sharing a cell with a psychopathic killer. Corey Bober was beginning to crack under this pressure. He continued to write letters to everyone in his life. His parents, Diana, Detective Tim Coble, etc. Almost all of them were aggressive in tone, with Coble later noting that Bober was most likely mentally ill, and attached this story to an unhealthy degree. But among all of this pressure, Bober felt some kind of further vindication. His long-believed suspect, Randy Atchziger, was arrested, charged, and later convicted of molesting two seven-year-olds. While this should have felt like sweet justice for Bober, having his victim behind bars, it wasn't enough. Corey Bober wanted to pin down Atchziger as the Green River Killer, and he wanted the credit for doing so. Anything less was deemed his failure. While still waiting for the test results from Michael Reiner's car to come back, Sergeant Carver and his associates scheduled an interview with their suspect to get a feel for him. In July, they called in Michael Reiner, and they pretty much cut to the chase. They began to grill him about Misty, his relationship with Trina, his alibi for the night of Misty's disappearance, everything. After being slightly prompted, Michael Reiner opened up about his juvenile rape incident, which he had been cleared of shortly after it happened. Because it was a juvenile incident, there was no way for the detectives to know the details. But it was true, he had been cleared of it entirely. They noted that he had been quote-unquote deceptive in some areas, but after failing to notice Ruben Schmidt's obvious deceptive tactics during a polygraph, one has to note their qualifications for the word. While not definitive, Michael Reiner would also later pass a polygraph test. Detectives were still hoping for a Hail Mary to come from the test run on Michael Reiner's car, but for now he was eliminated as a suspect. This sent them back to the only other guy on their list, Reuben Schmidt. Nearly an entire year had passed by the time Puyall police began circling Ruben Schmidt as a serious suspect. At this point, in September of 1993, the runaway charade had been stripped away by the public eye, and while they still publicly stuck to that story, they needed to do or find something for the case. Detectives began this next bout of investigating by talking to James Tinsley, a 16-year-old who had been Ruben Schmidt's roommate at the time of Misty Copsey's disappearance. Apparently, Reuben's family had been kicked out of their apartment, so him and his brothers moved in with Tinsley and his family for the time being. Tinsley had been there the night of Misty's disappearance, and unlike Reuben during his quote-unquote blackout, recalled exactly what happened. According to Tinsley, on September 17, 1992, Reuben had a 13-year-old girlfriend that was visiting the house. 
When Misty had called, asking for a ride, the 13-year-old girlfriend had gotten upset at Reuben and started acting jealous. A short while later, she would leave. This is where the story gets interesting. Tinsley claims that just 5 or 10 minutes after Reuben's girlfriend had left, Reuben himself left and didn't return until later in the evening, sometime around midnight. This was revelatory to everyone involved. Reuben had claimed to not remember anything, but this was a personal eyewitness who couldn't vouch for his whereabouts in the hours that Misty went missing. Tinsley would also claim that it wouldn't go against Reuben Schmidt's nature to murder Misty. He would claim that Reuben had a very short temper, was attracted to Misty, and he would actually believe it if Reuben had committed the murder, after knowing Reuben for quite some time. The detectives brought Reuben in again for another line of questioning, and wanted to get him to take another polygraph. He originally refused to take the polygraph, but eventually caved and also answered some of their questions. He would change his original statement slightly, saying that he had driven out to his grandmother's farm in Buckley during this blackout, not the next morning, but otherwise stuck to his original statements, that he didn't remember what had happened. Despite all of the suspicion surrounding him, he passed this polygraph, and his car was no longer available for testing. He had given his car to the wrecking yard, and it had been destroyed in the meantime. He was released one final time by the Puyallup police, and never again investigated as a suspect in the disappearance of Misty Copsey. To this day, Reuben Schmidt has never been questioned again. It seems like, in this story, every step forward is two steps back. At least that seems to be the theme running throughout. After Reuben Schmidt dropped off of the suspects list, Sergeant Herm Carver began to focus on Diana herself as a suspect. Despite her being an elderly caretaker in the hours that Misty went missing, and being the person that reported her missing and fought for her to be found, Carver began to focus on her yet again. He brought in Diana for questioning, asked her to take the polygraphs, and even began interviewing her former parole officer and ex-boyfriends. While Diana seemed to pass the polygraph test, Sergeant Herm Carver began circulating word of her supposed dishonesty to other detectives, such as King County's Jim Doyon. For a while now, he had been convinced that Diana and her ally, Corey Boper, had been responsible for planting the evidence of the pants found alongside Highway 410, and he had voiced that concern to other officers for some time. But now, as he began to take a further look at Diana's past, he also began to try and crack Corey Bober, recently sprung from prison and on work release. Bober was scheduled to take a polygraph test in March of 1994, but never showed up, stating that he didn't trust it to do anything but frame him for guilt. For all intents and purposes, the case to find out what had happened to Misty Copsey was in its death throes. In the following years, nothing of note really happened. Puyallup police again clung to the runaway story. In 1996, a story began circulating in the media that Misty would likely be making contact with her parents. Puyallup police had joined forces with Misty's father, Buck Copsey, and began hyping up an expected phone call from Misty as her 18th birthday approached. No contact would take place, but the Puyallup police would stick to the runaway label. In 1997, Corey Bober was charged again with four counts of dealing marijuana, but this time he decided to fight the charges and battle, tooth and nail, against what he perceived as a conspiracy by the Puyallup police to, quote-unquote, shut him up. Believe it or not, after more than two years, he actually won, and he managed to score a coup in the process. The forensic results from Misty's pants analyzed back in 1993. Using a stroke of genius, he had included the pants and the forensic analysis as part of his legal defense, claiming that he had assisted the police as a citizen investigator. And most surprising of all, it actually paid off. He got the results and was able to analyze them on his own. Boper discovered that on or nearby the pants were discovered samples of hairs and fibers, along with three red paint chips, which he immediately began battling to connect to his longtime suspect, Randy Atziger, and his red Porsche. For others, though, the red paint chips were indicative of something else. May 14th, 2001, in Lakewood, approximately 10 miles away from Puyallup, a 24-year-old woman is walking home from church in the rain 
at roughly 10 o'clock at night. As she walks, a white pickup truck rolls by. The mustachioed man inside asks if she needs a ride, and she tells him no. Despite this, however, the truck pulls over to the side of the road, and the man gets out. It's Robert Leslie Hickey. He had been released from prison just five years into his seven-year sentence, and he's been a free man for a matter of years now. He begins to approach the young woman, asking if he could have a cigarette. She says no, and crosses to the other side of the street, pulling the cell phone from her pocket and beginning to dial 911. Hickey rushes at her, pushing her over the 15-foot embankment on the side of the road. He climbs down, beginning to rip the woman's shirt and grab at her breast. And as she screams, he threatens to kill her. But he is instantly alarmed by the sight of three feared numbers on the bright cell phone screen. Nine, one, one. He grabs the cell phone and rushes off, but the woman is quickly able to rush home and call the police. Hickey is found shortly thereafter and is convicted for attempted second degree rape. Being his second serious offense, he is sent to prison for life with no possibility of parole. In the years since his two offenses, many have questioned whether it was Robert Leslie Hickey that was responsible for the disappearance of Missy Copsey, or even the two earlier Puyallup victims. He did commit one of his crimes just blocks away from where Misty disappeared at around the same time, and proved himself to be a serial offender capable of heinous things. Many have also questioned whether or not the red paint chips found on Missy's pants off of Highway 410 could have been connected to his red Camaro, which he owned during that time period. Later in 2001, as the Misty Copsey case file continued to collect dust, another cold case took a huge leap forward. On November 30th, Gary Ridgway was arrested as the Green River Killer, bringing to close a mystery that had left detectives throughout western Washington stumped for decades. To Corey Bober, though, this was a slap in the face. He did not believe that Gary Ridgway was the killer he had been looking for all of these years. It was Randy Atziger that was the true culprit in his eyes. Ridgway was just a patsy. Someone they dumped the murders on to look good. At least, that's what Corey Bober has continued to believe to this day. Even though Gary Ridgway has confessed to dozens upon dozens of murders, losing track of his numerous victims to the point of being unsure about their burial grounds, Bober doesn't believe a word of it. Detective Jim Doyon, who had long since been hunting for the Green River Killer, was one of the officers there to arrest Gary Ridgway, closing a large chapter of his well-respected life. However, despite all of the hard work in capturing Ridgway, Doyon and other detectives were not able to connect Ridgway to the Puyallup victims. They had always hedged their bets that whoever was responsible for the first two victims was also responsible for Misty Copsey, but it's fair to point out that Ridgway had a decent reason for not admitting to any abductions or murders in Pierce County. To do so would invite more charges upon him, and he had managed to escape the death penalty in King County by taking a plea deal and helping police track down where he had disposed of his victims' bodies. It's also worth noting that on September 17, 1992, Gary Ridgway was recorded as working an entire day at his job, which worked as a mark in his favor. To this day, the only real possibility of tying Gary Ridgway to the Pierce County crimes would be from a deathbed confession. To admit to any wrongdoings in another county would not only invalidate his deal, but it would put his life in jeopardy. Despite the arrest of Gary Ridgway, and actual evidence linking Ridgway to many of the crimes, Corey Bober has refused to accept that he is the Green River Killer. He has continued to orchestrate a convoluted series of events to conclude that Randy Atchziger is the Green River Killer, and dedicated his entire life to proving it. In 2000, Diana Smith had her daughter, Misty, legally declared dead. She held a funeral for Misty, and Bober's good side stepped in, talking a Parkland church into hosting the ceremony for free. He also managed to convince local flower shops to donate flowers for decorations, and he convinced the media to help turn it into a large event. If not for Diana, then for Misty's memory. Bober refused to let his witch hunt for Randy Atchziger go. He tried pin the three red paint chips as being connected to Randy Atchziger's red Porsche, and he petitioned for the police force to test the samples. It was a headache, and an expensive one, but the police finally conducted the test, which came back inconclusive. However, it was Corey Bober himself that noticed a fly in the ointment. The samples of the paint chips found with Misty's jeans had gone missing in the transfer between the police and the forensic testing company, Microtrace. They haven't been found to this day, and no one is quite sure who had them last, the police or Microtrace, who suffered a laboratory fire in 2008. Once again, Corey Bober scored a small victory. But yet again, it was too little and too late. 
In the mid-2000s, Diana Smith hired a private investigator to look into the case, using her limited resources to do so. The PI came up with nothing, but gave Diana a startling piece of advice. To ditch Corey Bober entirely. When trying to find information about the case, Bober not so politely told the investigator to do his own research and not ask him for any help whatsoever. The private investigator would tell Diana that Corey Bober was more of a liability to the case than an asset, and was perhaps holding back any potential researchers that might discover answers. Over the years, many have questioned whether Corey Bober himself was ever truly investigated as a suspect. The answer is actually no. He had a pretty solid alibi for the night of Misty's disappearance, as he had actually been assaulted by a neighbor sometime that evening. It had happened during an argument between the two, which isn't surprising considering Bober's nature, and a police report had been filed at 1.30 in the morning. Another factor to consider is that Bober has also never owned a car, nor possessed a driver's license throughout his life. The odds of him abducting someone are rather slim, even if he is a bit off his rocker. The hair samples found with Misty's jeans were tested just a few years ago, in 2013, but came back with no matches. They didn't match Misty or Diana, and didn't match with anybody else in the FBI's forensic database. So whoever they were, they were either an innocuous person whose hairs ended up on evidence, or a meticulous criminal that has escaped justice entirely. More recently, the Puyallup police still investigating the disappearance have asked for help. Without openly stating that the early investigators completely bungled the case, they implored that anyone with pictures of the Puyallup Fair, taken on September 17, 1992, share those photos with the Puyallup Police Department. They think that any pictures could help them uncover the truth behind Misty's disappearance. This relaunched investigation uncovered a tip from 1993, which revealed a claim that Misty had gotten in a car with an older man who was driving a yellow Chrysler Cordoba. The man was in his mid-30s at the time, and had a prior history of sexual assault on young women, with personal and professional ties to the Puyallup area. Police never investigated this tip, presumably sticking to their runaway story at the time and refusing to investigate anything further. This suspect's name and identity has never been released. In 2000, Reuben Schmidt was arrested for theft and did a small stint in prison. Then, later on in 2006, his wife got a domestic violence protection order against him, alleging that he had threatened to kill her and burn down their house. On December 17, 2015, over 20 years after Misty's disappearance, a mysterious posting appeared on Bizarre Daily News, a UK-hosted website. The anonymous author of this article claimed to be a relative of Reuben Schmidt, and stated that it was a family secret about Reuben's involvement in the case. This posting claimed that Reuben and his uncles were responsible for Misty's disappearance, and that they were all in that yellow Chrysler Cordoba seen by that unfollowed anonymous 1993 tip. Unfortunately, not much more information can be found from this anonymous poster, and any effort to dig into their quote-unquote confession comes up with nothing. Corey Bober and Diana Smith no longer speak to one another, at least not frequently. In the months and years following Misty's disappearance, they might have considered themselves allies or even friends joined together in search of the truth. But now they're merely former associates who once shared a common interest. If you look up Corey D. Bober on social media, you'll find a profile that types in all caps, knows no real sentence or paragraph structure, and tries to point out images of Misty in clearly photoshopped images. He claims to see the real truth, the kind of truth that only he is aware of. He has continued to claim that Randy Atchziger killed Misty and buried her body on an old property of his. However, he also claims that Randy Atchziger is the reincarnated version of Aleister Crowley and is the Antichrist, so it's understandable to see why his claims aren't taken too seriously by police. Bober has tried repeatedly to get permission to dig up the property formerly owned by Randy Atchziger and now by new owners, but of course he has failed multiple times. Diana Smith has adapted to life without Misty but she hasn't given up hope on finding resolution for her daughter. She has appeared on local shows, such as Crime Stoppers, in the hopes that information will come forward and bring about resolution to Misty's story. She isn't sure whether it was someone with a personal tie to Misty, or the work of a wandering serial killer, but she knows that the truth is still out there waiting to be discovered. Without naming names, she has clung to the belief that Reuben Schmidt was her daughter's killer, or at least knows what happened to her. Misty Copsey's whereabouts are still unknown, and just like all the stories I cover on this podcast, her fate remains unresolved. Hey. 
As I stated at the end of the last episode, this story would not have been possible without the hard work of the News Tribune's Sean Robinson. He pieced together so much information about the before, during, and after of Misty's disappearance in a three-part story called The Stolen Child. If you're interested at all at looking at the case on your own, that's a great place to start. Although I will caution you, the rabbit hole goes really deep on the story, so prepare to get lost at some point. I'll be honest, I don't really know what to think. There's a part of me that wanted to make this a hit piece on Ruben Schmidt and the shadiness surrounding him on the night of Misty's disappearance, but I just have to hope that there's something missing from the story. The police investigated him multiple times and came away with nothing, so I just have to hope that there's a reason he's never been investigated further. Mainly because the alternative is that a killer openly escaped justice without even a reprieve, but I just have to hope in the righteousness of our criminal justice system. Especially with a story like this, that strikes so close to home for me. There's just so many possibilities to this story. You have Michael Reiner, who was dating Trina and had a sketchy past. Then you have Robert Leslie Hickey, who committed the two violent crimes right around Misty. Then you have the Green River Killer, the prior two murdered Puyallup girls. It's just a giant puzzle that hasn't been arranged yet. Honestly, I'm not sure if it ever will. I hope it does, but I, I don't know. I have to give a huge credit to Tyson for helping edit all my stupid verbal flubs and creating the music and just being awesome when it comes to his end of the podcast. It's just been awesome. Thank you for all that you do, Tyson. We really appreciate it. I also have to thank Millimeters of Mercury, who created that ominous, creepy track you've heard throughout the last two episodes. It's called And the Glory, and I'll be including a link to it on the podcast website at theunresolvedpodcast.com. If you want to stay up to date with the podcast, you can find us on Facebook. Just search for The Unresolved Podcast. And you can also find us on Twitter at Unresolved Pod. Although, fair warning, I don't go on Twitter that often, so you probably get updates once every week or two. But if you want a quicker response, you could send an email to the Unresolved Podcast at gmail.com, or you could call in a text at 831 200 3550. I'll respond to those pretty much instantaneously. But that's it for this story and the tragedy of Misty Copsey's disappearance. If you want to donate to the podcast, you can head to the website and find a link to the PayPal account or the Patreon page, which will hopefully be up by the time you're hearing this. But hope that until next time, y'all stay safe. Talk to you later.